Good morning, Good. brothers and sisters. Uh, welcome back to City Light, man. We're super excited to have you guys here, and uh, I know Rolando and I are excited to be here. Oh, we're so excited this week, guys. Welcome from wherever you are. Just remember what City Light Church is all about in Ginsville, Florida. Yeah, let us know where you guys are tuning in from, man. We're always excited to see um, where our congregation online is at and, um, and where you guys are tuning in from. So definitely drop a line and let us know where you guys are at just for yeah. our own curiosities. And remember, City Light is where our mission is. Yeah, I mean, um, um, everybody's welcome. And I just want to tap into that. I mean, seriously, if you've ever thought about coming to City Light, everybody's welcome at City Light. If they let us two characters in... <laughs> You're most definitely welcome here. So uh, everybody's uh, welcome. Nobody's perfect. And everything is possible, guys. And that's guys. why everybody's welcome, because nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. So we that's want right. you here. We want you to join us, whether it's online or whether it's in person. We definitely want you here. And when you do come to City Light, when you are at home with City Light, I promise you anything can happen. Oh, boy. If anything can happen. Listen, we are in th week three of our session. God's uh, asking. That's yeah. asking, man. So. We wonder how it's going for you. How is how you seeing this? Uh, there's changes in our lives, that's for sure. You know, it has been in me in the personal level, man. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm grown. We're growing as a church too, and people around us are seeing us a little bit different because we are now noticing more things and more changes. Yeah, it's a good time to be a city light, definitely. Yeah, it's I a love good being time. here. Yeah, yeah, me too, man. I wish we would have this every single day. Absolutely. You know, but uh, yeah. So uh, going down, um, we remember the wor the questions that we are asking. You know, like, uh, for instance, in, um, where are you? Why are you so afraid, you know? And do you believe you can do this, or, you know? And I'm telling you, man, uh, just let, let your spirit take control of your emotions and see where it takes you. And to trust and believe that uh, there's uh, somebody unbelievable that wants yeah, to be your friend. Yeah, have big faith. Yeah. You know, I know last, last week it was, uh, <clears throat> you know, God's asking, and he was asking why we were afraid, but... You know, I think at the end of the day, we just need to have big faith, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, put your faith in him. Let him be the light to guide you and um, and just trust, you know. Uh, get rid of the, the fear and, and trust in him because he's not going to steer you wrong. Yeah. And just remember, man, this week God is going to speak to us in a different way. Um, and... Um, you know, ask questions. So yeah, he's gonna take us from where we're at to, to where, where we want to go. Be. Yeah, right. exactly. So um, I know we're getting close. We're about to get into our introduction video. Um, we're just gonna say a quick prayer. Um, Lord, please be with us today. Uh, please open up our minds, and even more importantly, open up our hearts. Let us be uh, just overfilled with what you have to offer. I know Josh is gonna bring an amazing word today. Yes, so let Lord. it fill our minds and fill our hearts, and uh, let's just have a. a a great start to a new week and, and go out and bless others today. So um, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We say these things in your name. In your Amen. name. Amen. So, so uh, yeah, welcome to Sea Light. Let's have a great Sunday. Let's have a great service and let's see what Josh has for us today. Yeah, and we'll see you after the service too. So enjoy. Have a great day. Bye.
little chilly out this morning, right? It's officially fall. Woo! Yeah. Well, welcome to City Light. If you're new here with us, we're so glad that you decided to join us this morning. Um, here at City Light, we believe that everyone is welcome. Nobody is perfect and anything is possible. Amen? Yeah. So we say it every week and it never gets old to say it. It never gets old to talk about it. It's one of the most important things that anything is possible because we serve a living God. I, I will never get tired of saying that. I say it every week, but seriously, it's, it's why we're here. It's why we're celebrating today. We have a reason to celebrate. Our God is alive. He's here today with us. So let's stand up. Let's sing. Let's celebrate this morning. Let's live in the freedom of what our God offers us because of the cross.
Lord, you're moving in this place. You're moving in our hearts. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our obedience. You're worthy of our lives. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing, every breath we'll ever breathe. We thank you for the truth and the hope that we hang on to of not only your love for us, but your undeserved, unmerited love for us. We worship you for who you are. We worship you for what you've done. It is our joy. It's our honor. It's our privilege to bow our hearts before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who invites us to call him Father and to say thank you. We love you with everything in you with everything in us, everything about you, we love you. And I, I think I can say with honesty, just across this room, every heart right in this moment is giving you permission to speak, to have your way. We're giving you permission to do what only you can do, Jesus, over these next few moments. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Can we thank our worship team for leading us this morning? Hey, make sure you uh, high-five somebody. Welcome them to City Light Church. I had to get a drink of water after all that singing. That was powerful. And I muted my phone today. Oh, yes. Praise God. Praise God. And I just wanted to, to start out by saying I muted my phone this morning, so there will be no interruptions. <laughs> God will not be calling on my phone anyway uh, this morning. And just good morning to everyone. You guys look great. I'm not sure if it's the cooler weather, you know, or just a spirit of optimism, but there's a great looking church uh, out there this morning. I want to welcome everybody joining us online. We love you, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, God is already doing amazing things among us. Amen. He loves to. It's what he wants to do. Uh, so we rejoice in that. Today we are in week three of our series that we've entitled God's Asking. Who's asking? God's asking. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at, we chose to look at four questions, four very important questions that Jesus asked. And one of the things that we learned was that all throughout the New Testament, people would come to Jesus asking questions. And only three times, church, only three times did he come back with a direct answer. All the other times, Jesus would do what a good counselor would do. And he would reply to our question, their question, with a good question. Because you knew on the other side of a good question is the best answer. Uh, so in week one, we looked at, there's a couple of disciples, all 12 of them actually. They're on a boat. They're in a storm, in the middle of a storm. It's raging. Jesus is sleeping in the boat. They shake him up. They're, Master, teacher, 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 we're going to die. We're going to drown. The ship's going down. Don't you care? And Jesus comes out and he talks to the storm and he talks to the waves and he rebukes them. He says, peace be still. Then he turns to his disciples and he asked the question that we asked ourselves. Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? You know who's in the boat with you. You know my presence is with you. You know I've got purposes for you. Why are you so afraid? It was an encouraging message. Uh, week two, Jesus asked two blind guys. They heard that Jesus was coming. They couldn't see, but they could hear. And they heard that Jesus was coming, and they started shouting at the top of their lungs with, with no, no bars held, right? Not holding back. They're shouting... Master, uh, son of David, son of David, have mercy on us. And we said that that very turn of phrase, son of David, was belief. It was their way of saying, we believe you are God. And so Jesus ignores them, and he walks right past them, goes right into the, the building that he's going into. And these blind men have to follow Jesus. They have to go to him, and once they're in his space, Jesus asks them this question that we asked ourselves. Jesus asked them, do you believe that I'm able? I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're walking through. But God is asking, do you believe I am able? 
Before we get into our, our uh, question for this week, I want to honor a special guest that we have in the room with us today. Would you guys help me honor uh, Pastors Jared and Courtney Matheson, uh, all the way from Green Crub Springs. We, would you all mind standing? Can we just give them a hand clap? The little one is with them too. We're so glad that you guys are here. Y'all, they are planting a new church called One Heart Church in Green Cove Springs. And as a young church, our heart goes out to you. We're so excited. And I love their title. In, in a time where we're so divided on so many fronts, doesn't God want a united One Heart Church? I, I love what you guys are doing, and it's a privilege today to stand with you. Thank you for worshiping with us. I'm glad you're here. So next week, bring out your friends. We're going to talk about something that we don't normally talk about in church. Uh, we're going to talk about spiritual doubts, something Christians don't typically talk about. We're going to look at a question that Jesus asks his disciples right after the resurrection. He comes to them and he says, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Is it okay, Josh, to have some doubts? Is it okay to have some questions Let's walk through it together next week. This week, as we dive in, we're going to be in John chapter 5, if you've got your uh, scriptures with you. Uh, but we're going to talk about a very important subject to the heart of Jesus. When he was asked by a guy, I'm sorry, when he asked the question, he asked the question of a guy who had been sick for 38 years. He'd been sick for 38 years, and Jesus asks him, do you want to be well? Imagine that. S 38 years, that's older than, than some of you are, more than you've even been alive. This man was sick, and Jesus said, do you want to be well? And I, I realized that that question is going to strike a chord with some of us this morning, and, and your story, what you're walking through. And I'm praying, and I'm believing, let's all pray together, that God would have his way, that when Jesus asks us this question, that we would find that behind a good question is the better answer. And there's a reason why Jesus asks questions. So this morning, I want to ask you to do me a favor. We're all walking through something, right? And long term, short term. Would you do me a favor of putting on the lens of whatever long term problem you're facing right now? Only you know, only you and God know what's that long-term problem that you've been facing. And would, would you be willing to look at this story in Scripture through the lens of whatever that long-term ongoing problem is for you? Maybe for you it's a medical issue. Uh, it could be chronic headaches or an ongoing battle in your life with depression. Or, or perhaps you've got just an over, uh, a re reoccurring problem of overspending or overeating or overcommitting. You know, for some of you, maybe it's an addiction that just won't go away and you're smoking stuff. You know you shouldn't be smoking. And maybe it's, a, it's the cigarettes or it's the marijuana or it's the crayons. I don't know. People smoke crazy things these days, but would you be willing to look at it through the lens? And I'm trying to quit. I'm trying to quit. I just haven't been able to yet. Let's look at it through that lens. For some of us, it's just this ongoing challenge of a relationship. Someone, and you know the person, their face just came to your mind. It's been an ongoing challenge with your dad, you know, with your sister, uh, with, with, your, your, with your spouse. And things just are not working the way they should be working. Let's look at it. Let's look at John chapter 5 through the lens of our ongoing problems. And we're going to believe, we're going to have faith that in the presence of Jesus, everything can change. Amen. Everything can change. John chapter 5 is our text if you've got your Bibles. If not, verses 1 through 9 are going to be on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. This is a touching story. If you haven't heard it, this is a touching story. John says this in verse 1. He said, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. I looked that up. That's five, you know, just rows of columns. And so here, I'll just, just take a brief second to describe what we just read. There's this pool by a sheep gate. And I don't want to distract us from the text, but it just, it, it, it struck me that whoever was the master planner of this community may have missed his or her calling. 
right? For some reason, I'm just thinking uh, out loud here that I don't want to swim in a pool that's by the sheep gate. I just, I just don't want to do it. I grew up working on a dairy farm, and I'll tell you, you don't want to swim in a pool that's located in a cow pasture, right? Just a little pastoral advice. You don't, you don't want to do that. So it says it's near the sheep gate. A couple years ago, my family and I, we went to go pick strawberries. We Googled online organic strawberries. We want to pick organic strawberries, right? And uh, the website said organic. So we're super excited. We, we drive all the way out there. And as soon as we pulled in, I noticed this very suspicious looking large hill line, you know, just kind of north of the, uh, the, the, the strawberry patch. And so I pulled out my phone. And the kids are already getting their baskets. They're already picking strawberries. You know, I Google our position. And then I just kind of slide the map a little bit so I can see. And sure enough, we were located right next to the county dump. And <laughs> that big hill was years and years and piles and piles of trash. And all I could think of is, in my mind was every time it rains... The water pours down that hill, crosses that road, through this field, and into the strawberry patch. I turned to my wife and said, honey, we ain't eating these strawberries. You're like, let the kids pick them to their, you know, whatever their heart's content. We're not eating the, the, these strawberries. Uh, now, thankfully, um, in this case, this pool was, was not a, a, a swimming pool. It was a natural body of water. And we're going to see in verse 3. Verse 3, it says, here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. So go with me. Let's teleport from here. Let's get into the story. Can you sense some of the smells, some of the sights, and the sounds? And maybe you've seen The Chosen, season two, episode four, and you can picture it perfectly. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But just not during the sermon. Wait till after the sermon. Okay, friend, just wait till after the sermon. Um, and, and go watch that. The Chosen Season 2, Episode 4. Uh, but as we read the text, maybe if you, if you put yourself in the situation, you might begin to wonder, you might begin to ask, why are all these disabled people gathered over here by this pool at the Sheep's Gate? And what you find out is there was a tradition probably even a superstition that an angel would actually stir up the water at the, the pool of Bethesda and they believed that whoever got into the pool first would be instantly healed. Instantly. And so you can only imagine, you, you might get there and wait for days or weeks or whatever, and as soon as the waters began to bubble up, it was a free-for-all. It was a rush to get into this water. So verse 5 it brings the story into focus. We start to just look at one man, a man who knows a thing or two, thing or two about long-term suffering, a man who knows a thing or two about the grace of God, and I pray that it lifts your heart. Verse 5, it says, One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him what? What did Jesus ask him? Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? That's our question today. Do you want to get well? Now, at face value, this seems like a ridiculous, ridiculous, like insulting question, doesn't it? I mean, that'd be like asking a poor, broke college student, do you want 100 bucks? <laughs> of course I want 100 bucks. That'd, that'd be like asking a football player who just finished his game, and he may have lost, he may have won, I don't know. Uh, we're not going to go there. He may have. <laughs> but you ask him, hey, do you want to go to the buffet, right? You want to go to the buffet and eat? Of course, right? What, what kind of dumb question? It'd be like my, 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 my wife asking me, do you want to make out? Right? That's a dumb question. Of course. Right? Let's make it happen. And it's, but Jesus asks, do you want to get well? It's a dumb question. Or is it? Verse 7. Sir, the invalid replies, I have no one to help me into the pool. 
when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. And a moment in the presence of Jesus changed a lifetime of problems for this man. Heavenly Father, today we are gathered together for your namesake and for your glory. And every single one of us right now are asking you for help. We're asking you to help us understand this text, help us apply it to our lives, help us to live in the grace that you offer. Help us, Jesus. We need it. In your name we pray, amen. Today I want to talk to us about problems that persist. Problems that keep hanging around. For 38 years, this man was sick, but in a moment, just in a moment, in the presence of Jesus, everything changes. I love that. I love it. But I see three realities that you and I face on a daily basis as we're walking through ongoing problems that are highlighted in this text. We're going to apply them to our lives. If you're taking notes, the first one is this the longer a problem persists, the more discouraged we become. The longer a problem persists, the more discouraged we become. As some of you, you've had an ongoing problem and it just will not go away. And you've prayed about it and you've prayed about it for however long and nothing has happened and you've tried everything that you thought would help, nothing's worked. And just like our guy in the text, you're discouraged. And you've, maybe you tried to work on your marriage and you prayed and you were nice, right? And maybe you went to church together, uh, but your marriage is still bad. And years later, you're thinking, I, I don't know if anything can help. I don't know. Or maybe you've been praying over a physical problem and you've been to your doctor and you've been to the next doctor and then you were like, I need somebody else's doctor here to, to talk to me and nothing has gotten better and you're discouraged even to the point of saying, you know, maybe this is just what God has for me. Maybe, maybe I'm just supposed to accept this. And it can be incredibly discouraging because one of the truths that we see in this passage is that the longer a problem persists, the more discouraged we become. The second reality I see is that the longer a problem persists, the more excuses we tend to make. The longer that problem ex exists in your life, persists, the more excuses we tend to make. And we start to make excuses uh, because ultimately it's going to make us feel better to blame someone or something else. I, I can deal with it if I've got these excuses. And that's what this guy does. He says, Jesus, I've got no one to help me to the water. I've got, I've got, I've got no one. I've got kind of this lame excuse. When I try, I can't walk. And they all run by, right by me. And I'm just left here hopeless and helpless. Now, I, and I'm not trying to be hard on this guy. I don't want to be hard on this guy. Not at all. I've never been in his shoes. And certainly, without a doubt, it would be difficult to be where he's at. But can we be honest? There had to have been a way to get to the water. 38 years, there had to have been a way. Right? Could, could he scoot? Could he roll? Could he low crawl? There had to have been a way to get to the water. And you'd think that within the first few months, of missing opportunity after opportunity that he would have found a way to get to the edge of the water. He would have found a way to position himself for the healing that he wants. And so, so that when the water did stir, so when the moment did present itself, he could just slip into the water. I'm right there and I'm ready. And here's what I, well, here's what I think. I think when we really want something, we find a way. When we really want it, we find a way. But this guy gets to the place where we so often do, this mindset, no one is going to help me. So I can't do anything. No one's going to help me. I, I can't do this. So my marriage, you know what? It just, it is what it is. No one can help me. 
It's never going to get better. Or, or, you know, I've been to the doctors. No one can help me. It is what it is. I'm never going to get a good job. I never finished college. It just is what it is. You know, I tried church. I tried God. I gave him two weeks. Nothing happened. It is what it is. Josh, I tried. It just isn't in the cards for me. Excuses. And the longer our problems persist, the more discouraged we become and the more excuses we make. The third thing I, I noticed that we all wrestle with this in long-term problems is that the longer a problem persists, the more we compensate for the problem. The more we compensate for it. In fact, some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about right now because you are excelling at compensating. And some of you are just, you're highly functioning alcoholics, right? Sure, it puts stress on your marriage. Sure, it puts stress on your children. But professionally, you're highly functioning. And people don't know, and if they do, they don't really care because you've figured a way to manage around it. And you're, you're highly functioning. And even though it's a significant addiction, you've found your way of managing it, compensating for it. Some of you in your marriage, you've just learned to compensate, just to exist. You know, you don't like it, but you accept it. It's just the way it is. There isn't intimacy. There isn't spiritual movement. It's kind of more of a business relationship. We're in it for the kids, right? We're staying together for the sake of the kids. It just is what it is. We don't like it, but we've learned to live with it. We've learned to manage it. Some of us... We're in a place where we've learned to compensate for a pornographic problem, a pornography problem. And we tell ourselves, you know, it doesn't really matter much. And you've learned how to not get caught and to manage your secret. And you just tell yourself, it's not that big of a deal. And you've learned how to compensate. Some of you have compensated for overspending. And people look on and think, dude, they've got it going on. Like, look at all that stuff. But they've got no idea that you've been living paycheck to paycheck for years. And you are the master. You're the master at, at switching credit cards. As soon as this one is maxed out, you switch it to this card with the 0% interest. And when that one comes time to make a payment, you switch it to the other one. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And you've learned to compensate. And here's the problem. I don't want you to miss this. You and I... We cannot change what we tolerate. We're never going to change what we choose to tolerate. And the bottom line is Jesus is asking this guy, do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? And I've been thinking about this question all week, just wondering why would Jesus ask him, do you want to be well? And perhaps it's because Jesus knew that you can't help someone who needs help. You can only help someone who wants help. You know it's true. It's so true. Uh, probably 20 years ago, my, my wife was in college. We're not that old, but if, maybe we are. It's just time has flown. Um, 20 years ago or so, uh, we were in college, and she had this best friend. And... And her best friend was dating somebody, and Allison was, you know, dating me. And so we had no choice. We had to be best friends. And uh, so we met, we hung out, a couple of bros, and we started liking each other right off the bat. Loved the guy. Uh, and just just hit it off. And we, we, we supported each other, enjoyed each other, you know, gave each other encouragement. And years later... Uh, uh, this guy, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just call him Drew. Um, Drew goes off and he, he joins the military, and he was so good um, in, in the military. And I, and I had tried to tell him, I'm like, look, I, I was in the Marine Corps. I get it, but you, you got to be careful in the military. It is not family friendly. And uh, I, one day I was on Facebook. I haven't talked to my friend in years. And I, I just saw something come across his page and every sign, you know, just uh, I knew I needed to contact my friend. And so he was overseas, couldn't talk to him directly. So I just I sent him a message and I was like, bro, 
what are you doing? I know we haven't talked in years, uh, but what are you doing? And the story plays out. A couple years later, he's in the thick of it. Um, things could end for his marriage. He could not see, you know, the whole family splitting, things like that. And I asked him, hey, you, you know, he's back in, in country. I was like, can I give you a call one Christmas? So I give him a call, and I'm walking around uh, my, my in-law's front yard, and I'm talking to my, my friend Drew, and, I, and, and I'm listening to him tell, him tell tell me his situation and the decisions he made, and he's, gonna, he's probably going to lose everything. And I'm praying to God. I'm like, God, I have no idea what to say to my friend. How do I help him? And I... I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, ask him what he wants. And so I was like, Drew, I don't know what to say to you, but I just feel compelled to ask you, what do you want? What do you want? And he wrestled with that question for a few moments and he honest, was honest, I just, I really don't know what I want. And then I, and I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, well, ask him, what, what do you think God wants? What do you think I want? And so I asked him, what do you think God wants? What does God want? He's like, he's like, Josh, honestly, I don't know what, what God wants. I was like, I'll tell you what God wants. God wants to help you. He wants to help you right where you are. What do you want? It's an important question. Jesus asks this very specific question. Do you want to be made well? In fact, you may ask, What's the greatest hindrance to faith? What's the greatest hindrance to faith in, in my life and in your life? And some answers that just pop off the, right off, you know, we might say, well, fear. Fear is the greatest hindrance to faith. What a great answer. You know, worries, the worries of life, they hinder my faith. Or perhaps, you know, you might say doubt. My doubt is, is an enemy of my faith. But in this story... And in so many of our stories, the greatest obstacle to faith is the familiar. The familiar. Think about this paralytic's perspective. He might say to us today, see, you don't understand. 38 years, I've been unable to walk. It's all I know. You couldn't possibly understand. I've tried everything possible. I've got my resume of excuses, and I don't like it. I don't like it, but it is what it is. I've learned to manage around it. It's my familiar. And for some of us, maybe we're trapped right there. Where, where you've just learned to accept it. Whatever it is, believing um, it, it, that there could never be anything else. I'm just going to accept where I am. I'm not going to believe in what could be. And, and we might say, no. See, you understand, I'm an average student. I'm not just an average student. I've known it since seventh, second grade. And I, I know it today. I, I, I'm just, that's my familiar place. That's what I'm comfortable with. I'm just average. Or no, 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 you don't understand, Josh. Our family, we've struggled financially for years. My, de my, my uh, parents struggled financially. Their parents did. My kids probably will. My spouse and I, we are. We're struggling financially. It's just the way it is. Or we might stand up and say, no, you don't understand. We're all alcoholics. It's just generational. It's genetics. The bottle has beat our family. It's just whatever. We've learned to live with it. We just don't talk about it. We try not to celebrate holidays together. It just is what it is. But do you hear what God is asking? Do you want to get well? Do you want it? Because until your desire becomes bigger than your disability, you will not find healing. Until my desire becomes bigger than my disability, I'm not going to find healing. And so Jesus asks us today, do you want to be made well? Well, because honestly, so many of us, we find ourselves compensating, making excuses, and living stuck. And I believe the Spirit of God is asking us today, do you really want to be out of debt? You know, shopping is your drug of choice, and you may say you want to be out of debt, but your actions are not lining up. Do you really want to be well? Do you really want to be out of debt? Do you really want to overcome that addiction? 
Because the truth is, some people are more comfortable with the known. And since it's all they know, they choose the comfort of the known over the discomfort of the unknown. Like, I know what these shackles feel like. I know what this prison feels like. At least I know what to expect. And maybe you've got a friend or someone you love and they're living in their own prison. I've learned you cannot help someone who needs help. You can only help someone who wants help. Do you really want it? Because you cannot change what you're willing to tolerate. And until the desire becomes bigger than your disability, you're not going to begin to see healing. And so Jesus asked this man who had been in this situation for 38 years, do you want to be well? And I just want to point out today, I do not care how long you've been down. With the presence of Christ, you're not out. I, I don't care how long you've been in bondage to something today. In the presence of Christ, you're not out. I, and I can't just tell somebody today that the life that you gave up on years ago is still possible in the presence of God. I don't care if it's been three months, three years, or three generations. I'm standing on a greater truth. That the moment we recognize the presence of God and we respond to his invitation, it can transform everything. Do you want to be well? And that's going to speak to somebody because there's something here that's holding you down. There's something that's holding you back and you've been miserable. You've been living with it for years. And when God heals you, here's the exciting thing is Satan will not be able to silence you. There's a, there's a testimony on the other side of your story, the power of your story. You know what? God healed my headaches. God healed my husband. God helped overcome my fears. And the longer this problem persisted in your life, the more glory God is going to get because you're going to realize I could have never done this on my own. And here's what this guy says. He says, I've got no one to help me out. I've got no one. And then Jesus, he looks at the guy and he says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. I just love this. He looks at the man in his 38 years, in his conditions, in his problems, in his excuses and says, get up. So notice this, Jesus is about to mess with all of our categories. Watch this. The first thing I want you to see is that the sick guy did not ask to be healed. I love this. He is too stuck to know what to ask. And Jesus is like, hey, look, I've got enough faith for both of us, bro. Get up and walk. The second thing is this guy did not earn it. He didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve this healing. And the third thing is this, the healing did not happen the way that he thought it was going to happen. In his mind, right? And this is, this is going to speak to somebody. In his mind, the miracle was in the water, just out of reach. His miracle was out of his reach. And Jesus steps onto the scene. And I, I don't think there was music, but in my mind, it's dun, 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 You know, I just, that's the way I picture it. And his cape is flapping, but that probably didn't happen. But he steps onto the scene. He says, I'm going to blow your categories. And Jesus did for him what he didn't even know to ask for. And I wonder if that day when Jesus comes walking up, he's like, oh, a kind soul, a kind soul, somebody who can help carry me to the water's edge, finally. Somebody who can carry me to the water. And Jesus is like, no, bro, I am the water. I am the water. And I hope you don't miss this. This is one of a million reasons why our greatest priority in life is to press in to the presence of Jesus. 
is, is to press into these times of worship. It's one of a million reasons why when we wake up in the morning that the first meditation of our heart is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I exist to give you glory. My life is not my own. I surrender it to you. I'm all yours. Today's your day. You made it. I get to live in it. I'm thankful for it. And as we get to know Jesus, as we get close to Jesus, listen to this. He will do things for you that you never even knew to ask him to do. He'll bring healing in your life in areas where you didn't know that you needed healing. When you press in to Jesus, when you get into his presence, he'll change your thought processes in ways that you didn't even know were dysfunctional. He'll bring forgiveness and healing and grace to your hearts in areas that you didn't realize were sick. When you get close to Jesus, when you get close to Jesus, he will do things for you you didn't even ask him to do. That's what he does. Like this guy, he didn't deserve it, he didn't earn it. And Jesus did not heal this man because the man was good. We get that, right? Jesus did not heal this man because the man was good. Jesus healed the man because Jesus was good. Grace stepped onto the scene. Grace entered your life. You didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, it's what Jesus does. And yes, it's just like Jesus to bring a blessing. It's just like Jesus to bring a healing. It's, it's just like him to bring transformation in some way that you didn't even expect. That's the power of our good God. But I want to show you one more thing. Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And I think, I think we could translate that to say, I don't want to hear your excuses. I want to see your faith. I don't want to hear any more excuses. I want to see your faith. Don't tell me what you can't do. Don't cry about what people won't do for you. I want to see you stand. I want to see you walk. And notice that Jesus doesn't offer a helping hand. In the text, Jesus does not reach down. He doesn't pick him up. He doesn't come behind him and lift him from his shoulders. He looks at him and says, stand. It's time to stand. Get up and walk. And I don't know what that is going to do for you. I hope it's a, a message of grace. I hope that you sense his grace. Jesus says, I will not do for you what you must do for yourself. I'm going to do everything you cannot do. I'm going to do everything that you cannot do, but I will not do what you only can do. Yes, I'm going to change you. I am going to heal you, but I want to see your faith. I want to see you do what for 38 years you've been telling yourself I can't do. I want to see the courage and the faith to step away from the familiar, to step away from that prison you're so comfortable with, those shackles that you've come to know, you've named them. And you're gonna have the faith today to stand up when you think that your legs are not capable of supporting you. I haven't trusted these legs for 38 years. And somebody today is gonna take a step of faith and overcome a problem that you gave up on years ago. And I don't know what that might look like for you. Some of you on the way out, you're going to drop your cigarettes in the can. Just, just on, on the way out. Some of you are going to confess to your city group that, man, I just, there's a place in my life that needs healing. Some of you are going to forgive someone that hurt you a long time ago. Some of you are going to check into rehab. You're going to call a counselor. I don't know. But what I do know is it's going to take a significant step of faith. And God is going to touch you. And for some of you, you will experience instant healing. Others of you may begin a journey that leads to healing. And you thought, you know, I, I, was, I was just going 
uh, I was just coming through to, to get to the water. I, I was just trying to get to the water. And you had no idea that today, when you were walking into church, that that thing that you thought would heal you, that the way that you thought God was going to heal you, wasn't the thing he was going to use. He wanted to see your faith. He wanted to see you come into church, walk into his presence and be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wanted to spark in you a faith in your heart that you haven't had for who knows how long. And someday, someday soon, people are gonna see you, see you again and they're gonna be like, why are you so excited? Why do, you've got, why do you have so much hope? Why is there freedom in your expression? And, and you're going to explain it I, like, well, I really don't know how to put words around this, but God is with me. God spoke to me. I experienced Christ. And then I saw and I felt his love in the presence of his people on church on that October. What's today's date? 17th. And this is the way it's going to be for some of us that we're going to have a new hope found in Christ. And God is asking us, do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? Do you want to overcome the addiction? Do you want to be free of worry? Do you want to be free of anxiety, that, that fear that keeps you up all night? Do you want to be free of that angry spirit that just hurts every relationship around you? Do you want to overcome your inability to trust people so that you can experience intimacy again? Do you want God to do something to heal a physical sickness? Do you want to be made well? Because Jesus isn't going to heal someone that needs help. He's going to help those who want help. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit and in your love that your presence today would minister to our faith, that it would lift our hope, that we would find healing in your presence among your people today. As we pray, some of you right now would say, God is speaking directly to me. And I've got an ongoing problem and I want to take it before God and believe by faith that he can help, that he can make me well. If that's your prayer, would you just lift your hands right now in an act of faith. I bring this before God. God, I'm bringing my ongoing problem to you. Lord, you see our hands. Thank you that in your presence, in this place, we thank you for the healing power of Jesus. And I pray today that in your presence, faith would be built. I pray that by your power, you would do miracles, set people free, bring healing today. In fact, I know that you're going to work. And I also know you don't want to hear our excuses. You want to see our faith. And so I pray that we would take steps of faith, appropriate steps of faith as you lead us. And that you would see our faith and be pleased by it. And we pray that in your presence that the healing would begin. And even for some, the healing is already taking place and we will give you all the glory for all that you do because we believe you're a good God who will even do things that we don't ask for. And not because we're good, but because you're good. And we thank you that, that we may do them in a way that, or you may do them in a way that we wouldn't expect and we'll give you all the glory because you're the only one worthy of praise. As we keep praying today, some of you right now, you are very sick. The reality is all of us without Christ, we have a sin sickness. Our sin keeps us from God. And in a moment of honesty, you're going to realize, you know what? I have done some bad things. I've done some things I regret, and the weight of my sin is pressing on me. Sometimes you may wonder, could I ever be right with God after all I've done? And this is the good news of God, that he still loves you. Do you realize there's nothing you can do to make him love you any more and there's nothing you can do to make him love you any less because he loves you period not because of who you are but because of who he is he 
is love. That's who our God is. Love is not what he does. Love is who he is. And he loves you because that's who he is. And because he's so good in his love, he did something for all of us that we could never earn, that we could never deserve. He became one of us in the person of his son, Jesus, who was without sin. So he could become a sin for us, die in our place so that anyone, and that includes you, anyone who calls on the name that is above every name will be saved, forgiven, and transformed. Do you want his forgiveness? Do you want his grace? Do you want to be spiritually well? Do you want to belong to him? Do you want the promises of eternity and the hope of a life on earth to bring him glory? Do you want to be well? Some of you, you know I'm here for this moment. It's time to say yes to Jesus. Do you want to be well? Do you want to surrender your life to Christ? If that's your prayer, would you lift your hand right now in an act of faith? I'm gonna pray with us. No one prays alone. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Jesus, save me, transform me, make me new. I believe that you died for me so that I could live for you. I thank you for the new life that I have in you. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Church, let's stand together. Let's worship our good God in song.